Hello, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you may be. Welcome to our wearables audio design fundamentals session two. Today's topic will be on auditory signal processing, basically the necessary signal processing required for audio on wearables. The topic for today's presentations are we will briefly describe uh, what are the basic building blocks of an audio system. Then we will walk you through the auditory signal processing, auditory transform, the challenges we have on the, because these wearable devices are personalized devices and how we can personalize the experience on these uh, small form factors. We will briefly uh, discuss that here as well. With that, so this is the, these are the basically a basic building block of a typical telco endpoints. We'll be describing the signal processing aspect. Basically, when you receive a signal from microphone, how will you process that? Or when you receive a signal from radio and how you will process that? So what kind of a signal processing you will need in order to have a duplex conversation? The algorithms that we will be not talking in this uh, discussion, but there will be enough technology or a signal processing that we will eventually be use, using to design uh, these algorithms during our next session. These are basically acoustic echo cancellation, acoustic noise cancellations, equalizations, bandwidth extension, enhanced noise cancellation, noise reduction, and dynamic range compressions. With that, last time around, we discussed about how the speech waveform is originated. It's basically a convolution of glottal pulses with the vocal track model, which is basically acts as a filter. And this is when we start speaking, uh, how the speech waveforms are originated. Start with transients, followed by this periodic signal or a tonal signal, and then this pseudo random noise. So this, the one that starts with this periodicity that represents basically a pitch, which is the harmonics generated by the fundamentals of an individual. Uh, so that's a voice part. The unvoiced part is basically this, uh, which is responsible for what we also call a consonants, uh, the clarity in the sound. So sound has these transient, tonal, and pseudo random noise. So speech is basically a non stationary signal. Now let's see how do we process it, how machine understands it. So we have a glottal pulses, then we have a, a vocal track frequency response. What it is responsible for? It it's basically a format uh, that a that carries an identity of a sound waves. And then when it comes through our glottal pulses, glottal sorry, the glottal pulses come through our mouth. It basically modifies this wave, and that's where the speech is basically produced. Now let's see how can we separate these. Our goal is to understand what this filter is and how we can extract features out of it. So in auditory signal processing, or when we are feeding this information to a machine, we are not interested on the glottal pulses. We are interested on separating glottal pulses and this transfer function of the filter that is basically modifying this speech. So how we can make that happen? Mathematically, if we wanted to see that what's when the signal comes, we are convolving that with a filter. So these are the glottal pulses. Glottal, glottal pulses are convolved with a filter in a time domain representation. In frequency domain, convolution becomes a multiplication. So we are multiplying the filter transfer function with the glottal pulse. We wanted to separate them. So for separating them, what we do, we take a log. And by taking a log, we can, instead of a multiplication, we can do the summation, okay? So that's basically a mathematical representation of how we can separate glottal pulses with the filter response. And computationally, how that is done uh, can be seen here. Basically, a time domain signal comes in. Next, T, first thing we do, we apply a short time for a transform. We take absolute value of that. Then we take a log. So log is there to separate glottal pulses 
from the filter. And there is one more step here, which we'll discuss a little later, is a mel filter. So we apply a mel filter here, and the purpose of the mel filter is to, because we have too many, too much information here. So it, it's to make this one more like how our auditory system behaves, uh, we need to have a kind of a nonlinear uh, picture representations. And MEL filter allows us to do that. <clears throat> now we have a lot of information here. When we are converting that into the spectral domain, we wanted to remove some of the some of these informations. And uh, to do that, what we do, we apply a, basically a cosine transform. And cosine transform decorrelate these unwanted signals and only provides us the signal of our interest. So basically what happened here is, uh, let's go to the terminology basically. So what we are doing is we are in the Fourier domain and in the Fourier domain we call this a spectrum in separal domain. So going, going back again here, uh, in spectrum, basically we are get kind of coming back to the time domain. It is not really a time domain, but looking on from Fourier transform, we go to the frequency domain. Then we take the I inverse of that and we come back into the time domain, conventional approach. However, when we apply a MEL filter here, we take a log of that. Uh, what it is providing us here is it's providing us a substral domain. Not really time domain, but a substral domain. And so a little bit change in the terminology here. So in MEL frequency substral coefficients, basically the spectrum becomes substrum, frequency becomes Q frequency, filtering becomes lifting, and harmonics becomes a harmonics. So now let's see what's happening. So when we went back into the Q frequency, means in a substral domain, we have this signal and then the high frequency signal. Again, since we are separating the two waveforms here, uh, the one that's generating a formants and the one that's giving us a glottal pulses, and we can remove the glottal pulse by applying a low pass filtering and keep just the filter. So that's basically what we'll be doing here. So these are the steps we use. We we'll take a waveform, time domain waveform, we do the windowing. And that windowing, then once we apply a photo transform, it becomes a sort time photo transform. Uh, usually, we need to do a, at least 50% overlap here in order to remove the first half and the second half of the signal, which is unwanted. <clears throat> and so these are the steps that you will need to take in order to generate a MEL filter coefficient. Once we get these MEL -pel coefficients, then this information is fed to the machine learning algorithm like CNN, RNN, or AI algorithms. And that you can use it for speaker identifications, identifying what sound or what, what this pattern is, uh, speaker identification, speaker recognition, keyword. Like you are saying, Alexa, turn on the light. We train, keyword is Alexa, and then action is turn on the light. So. You can have a VAD followed by this action. And these are the pre-processing we will need to do for man-to-machine man translation. We can see that MFCC, uh, it's a very simple, straightforward signal processing. However, it comes with some pro and cons. So the key advantages of MFCC is that it describes the large structure of spectrum and ignores the finer structure. Works well for a speech and music. So you can use it for speech as well as for music. However, its key dis disadvantage is that it's not robust to noise. And when we will go back talking about the auditory transform, and we'll say what are the what that limitations stands here for. It requires an extensive engineering knowledge engineer. Means you need to know what these parameters are. And then it does not provide you a sufficient, I mean you cannot really synthesize. Once you are on MFCC, you are there. So these are some of the limitations. The next topic we want to get into is a auditory transform. We'll discuss during this 
section for a transform, basically a short time for a transform. Wavelet transform, we will describe it as continuous versus discrete wavelet transform. And then we will also discuss a third type of transform known as a scattering wavelet transform. Fourier invented the Fourier transform way back. And what it does, it converts signal from time domain to the frequency domain and back from frequency domain to time domain. It's a very powerful tool and it has been most widely used up until today. Since 18th century and up until today, we are still using Fourier transform. However, there are some limitations of the Fourier transform. It cannot model the transient signal. The signal has to be periodic. So it's not really a great fit for non-stationary signals. Why that is the case? Fourier transform use sine and cosine as its basis function. So by default, it assumes that all the signals we have on the universe consist of these sine and cosine functions. And for the time being, this was a little oversimplified picture. Let's see. So Fourier transform does not give you precise, it, either it gives you a frequency information or a time information, but not both. So to get the time information, what we do, we apply a, a window function there. And so uh, we can have a time frequency representation. However, this window function, this window size is fixed. So you cannot really change it. So uh, you cannot really have a true time frequency representation. And to achieve that, basically we, the technique we discussed earlier today, uh, it cannot really give a, a true uh, the information you are looking for. So to get there, what we need is a, so it's a basis function R sine and cosine. Uh, but when you go, our auditory filter requires a nonlinear kind of a response. With short time Fourier transform, they are all, see, fixed window. And to get this nonlinear space filters, this is where this MEL filters come into picture. These are a triangular filters, and this models precisely what the human auditory systems response is. So that's basically, I was discussing earlier why you need to have a MEL filter. This is the reason why we use a MEL filter because Fourier transform does not represent truly the our cochlear response or base layer membrane frequency response. So that's why the MEL filter comes into picture here. All right. So the limitations we describe that because it when there is a noisy environment, Fourier transform cannot really model the transients properly. So how we can achieve with that? So there is a next transform we are going to talk about is a wavelets. Now going back to one of the very important physics principles and the limitations of Fourier transform has to do not with Fourier itself, but they were too concerned about the fundamental principle of physics called Eisenberg's uncertain entity principle. It says you cannot know where particles particle is in or how fast it's going. It can say one thing at a time, not both. Same thing in the Fourier transform, you can be sure about the frequency or a time, but not both. And that's why they, so if you draw these Heisenberg boxes, you have these fixed boxes. Whereas if you take a speech, you need these variable boxes and how to get there. So Fourier transform, if we take time, frequency, these boxes are constant. These are rectangular boxes. On the other hand, the wavelets, wavelets are a small wave. And wavelet is a French word basically die out after a certain time. So these are little waves which you can compress, stretch, contract, stretch, depending on the signal, as you can see from here. So it precisely allows you to, it's wavelet are called basically a mathematical zoom function. So let's see how this works. So for your transform, it works great for capturing global features. It uses sine and cosine basis function, which goes from minus infinity to plus. Infinity. On the other hand, the way that provides local information, frequency details and temporal details, and it meets the admissibility conditions and provides a finite energy as opposed to Fourier transform, which gives you an infinite energy. You can't really localize information that way. So Fourier transform cannot provide a time frequency details. Local features are lost. 
specifically for non-stationary signals. It treats all frequency equally. And there is an example. If you wanted to model a traffic light, you have a yellow, green, and amber light, and somehow the light starts malfunctioning. Fourier transform cannot precisely tell you which light is malfunctioning because it doesn't have that time information. And therefore, it's not suitable for non-stationary signals particularly. It cannot really tell when a particular frequency existed. Mathematically, Fourier transform is represented by this equation. On the other hand, wavelet transform is a very robust signal processing technique. It is orthonormal and translation invariant. It is a scale and shifted version of the mother wavelet. And we'll talk about what basically mother wavelet is. Easy to implement. It's very accurate and power efficient. And it's a very portable architecture. And mathematically, this is how we can represent a uh, wavelet transform. Now, this is a great uh, YouTube video, and you can get there. And so basically, what it's a sinusoidal function plus a Gaussian type window. And this becomes basically a wavelet. So you take any function you can be calling a wavelet, provided it meets these conditions. Zero mean, basically, if you integrate a function, within the limits, its average should be zero. Mean value should be zero. That's an admissibility condition. If you take energy, so basically you take a mod square and then integrate it, it should show you a finite energy as opposed to course. For a transform also show the admissibility conditions. However, it cannot, the function goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And if you integrate it, it will give you infinite energy. And this is one of the most limitation of a Fourier task. So any wavelet uh, you can use, provided it meets these conditions. By the way, wavelets are a family of function. It's not just a sine and cosine. It's a family of function. And depending on your application, you can choose a filter from a library of filters, as a library of uh, wavelets, or design your own that meets your requirement. So coming back to how you can analyze or decompose a signal with wavelets. The wavelet has a mother wavelet and a father wavelet, and then it has a child wavelet. So it's basically a complete family. Child wavelets are created from the parents, and that's where these wavelet decomposition come into picture. So basically what's happening here, we take a wavelet, then we do scale and shift, shift in time and a scale in frequency. So at large scale, you will use, you will analyze a low frequency. At a small scale, you will analyze a large frequency. And then you move it around, shift it around. So you have a signal and you scale, shift, and then analyze this. So this is how the shift operations can be represented mathematically. Now, and this is, do you want it to show how the wavelet, so you can stretch it or contract it. And then, you move it around. So it's basically a, a mathematical zoom or a microscope. You zoom enough so that you can analyze your signal. And rest is basically a convolution process. Uh, you have a filter and you have a signal. You are convolving these two to get the output. So that's a simple mathematical concept about the wavelets. Now, and how this can be done, as I was explaining earlier, you pick up a wavelet, move it around, analyze this, then scale it down and repeat the process, scale it down and re repeat the process. And these are called a decomposition. So you basically pick a particular scaling function, shift it around, then go to the next level, means different scaling function or different frequency and analyze it and so on and so forth. For example, for a speech, you will take a 16K speech and pick up your mother wavelet, split that into low pass, high pass, and then use this mother and a father wavelet to analyze the signal. So that's basically what we'll be showing. Now, here is an example, a hyperbolic trip signal. This is basically a Fourier transform. And you can see that we struggle to really separate these two signals down here. If we apply a, a scalogram, which is a wavelet transform. Well, by the way, short time Fourier transform gives a two dimensional representation. Wavelet transform gives you a three-dimensional information, scale, shift, and kilogram. So 
you can clearly see that you can separate these two signals. There are two types of wavelet transform, continuous and a discrete wavelet transform. Uh, continuous wavelet transform, it all depends on how you select these scale and shift functions. If it is in a two raised power, say it depends on how many scaling, how many decomposition layer you do. For example, for a speech, a uh, sample at 16K, you will need about five to six decomposition layer, depending on how far you want to go. For example, you wanted to go all the down to the fundamentals, so you will need a six decomposition level. And this, this is basically how you will decompose the signals. Uh, here is how it shows here. So you take a low pass and a high pass. This is a basically a approximation and detail, basically a wavelet, mother wavelet and father wavelet. So you take them and this the, it's also called an approximations and detail. And so it's basically a repeated process. You take a signal, high pass, low pass, high pass, low pass, until you go down to the fundamental. And if you plot these two together, precisely looks like a, our auditory system response time. So you can see that we really don't need to do much magic here. You take a wavelet, mother and father wavelet, and start decomposing the signal. And you can precise, precisely analyze signal here. For example, you want to filter out the noise. And these are, if it's a speech signal, you can see that uh, at various decomposition layers, signal will be correlated. Whereas if it's a noise, high frequency noise, you probably will see that this is at this particular decomposition layer. You can use uh, some sort of a thresholding schemes there and filter it out. And during decomposition, you can automatically see that the noise is gone. So that's basically one application of how you can use the wavelet decomposition. You want to implement a discrete wavelet transform, and these are the process basically. Say high pass, low pass, down sampling. So you keep the high pass, these are the detail. Then you come back, the scaling, and you high pass, low pass, down sampling, high pass, low pass, and down sampling. And these are the decomposition layer, or depending on how far you want to go. So if it's a 16K, that's 8K, 4K, 2K, 1K, and 500 hertz for a speech. Let's take an example here. The first thing we do a discrete wavelet transform, you decompose it. And what I was saying earlier that by using a proper thresholding, you can denoise the signal. So discrete wavelet transform you use and denoise the signal. Then you can apply you reconstruct a signal, then you can apply a continuous wavelet transform. And by doing that, what you can do, you can have the scalogram for various speech patterns, noise patterns, or signal patterns. So instead of creating a MFCC, what you are doing here is you are creating these scalograms for machine learning purpose. And then you feed this information to your neural network, CNN, followed by fully connected network, and do exactly the same thing what you have been doing for take a Fourier transform, then apply a mel filter and all other things. This is exactly where you can do on top of that. You can also denoise your signal. So this is very elegant way of applying this transform for machine learning applications. Now, that's about the wavelet transform. It has many other applications. You can use that for speech analysis, for biomedical application, for any known case study signals, including in the noise environment. The next flavor of wavelet transform is called a wavelet scattering transform. So the key object is finding a better auditory transform for machine learning, which is invariant to translation, rotation, and scaling. Because all we are doing is we are decomposing signal. We are translating, and we are rotating, and we are shifting. So we need to have a mechanism which is invariant to all these operations and how we can make that happen. So wavelet transform is basically taking a signal and decomposing this one with the mother and father wavelet. The next operation, by the way, when we go back to CNN, what CNN does basically is it's doing pooling, convolution, convolution, pooling, convolution, pooling, and nonlinear function, RALO. We can do same thing here. Now coming back to 
So what's happening here is we can take a father wavelet. We can take a mod of that. And then when we convolve that with the scaling function, so take a mother wavelet, take a mod, and then convolve that with the approximated for a low pass. And this generates a scattering coefficient. So basically, you do decompose a signal and you apply these operations. Take a mod and then convolve that with the scaling function. And this generates a scattering wavelet transform. And this is basically the operation here. Take a signal, convolve with the, this is a low pass, this is a high pass. And this is the zero, zeroth scattering wavelet coefficients. So the operation we are doing here, convolutions, modulus, modulus does the nonlinearity, and then the averaging, which is a low pass. And you keep repeating this one, zeroth order, first order, second order, third order. And this has a property of, if you remember from CNN, convolutional neural network, you are convolving a signal with a filter. The filter is arbitrary filter. Then you apply a nonlinear function, which is a RALU, or depends on which function you use. And then you are doing pooling. Convolution, nonlinear function, pooling. And that's the process you repeat. Same thing you are doing here. So basically, whatever CNN is doing, you are doing this one with the scattering wavelet transform. The key advantage of this are it provides, it's a basically, Modulus is a kind of a pooling operation. So you you are using a pure signal processing technique to do the same thing what CNN will do. If we integrate modulus of the convolution, and this gives L1 naught, which makes it invariant. Next, the convolution of wavelet with the father wavelet makes it a time invariant. The repeated application of the modulus moves the energy content in the higher frequency of the original signal towards the lower frequency. So energy from the higher frequency will just come towards the lower frequency. And you keep decomposing it until energy is dissipated. If you, are, you have no energy, then you don't need to decompose it further. And that's basically the concept in scattering wavelet transform. You're trying to find the energy. And here is a scalogram basically showing that you can precisely, it gives you a detailed information. And then you can feed this one to your neural network to extract the information that you are looking for. So the auditory transform, which is scattering wavelet transform, is a very powerful technique for signal analysis, specifically known as state study signals, where for a transform struggles, wavelet transform can help us there. So coming back to CNN architecture. So in the CNN, basically, we are taking these kernel functions, convolving this, and applying a nonlinear process. And this is basically a repeated process. You have a filter, convolving your kernel function with this, taking a RALU, and then pulling, and, and you keep on doing. What's the problem with all this? A, you need a large data set to train your network, basically to generate the filter coefficients that you are looking for. In scattering wavelet transform, there is no training required. You are using a mathematical operations to do the same task. So it appears to be much more powerful signal processing technique to do the same thing what CNN is doing for a signal like a speech or biometric signal or biomedical signals. You can do this in real time. You don't need a large data set. You can use a small data set and achieve the same thing. So combining or comparing wavelets versus CNN, wavelet scattering transform versus CNN. They both are generating a filter. We are starting with that non-filter in scattering wavelet transform. In CNN, it's an arbitrary filter, and then you are training it. But at the end of the iterations, it gives you the same filter at the end. In a scattering wavelet transform, you don't really need to go beyond maybe second stage, at the most third stage, but nothing beyond that. And you can precisely see how far you need to go because you are looking on the energy of a signal. And momently your energy dissipates, you don't need to go there. So computationally, it is efficient. And more or so, you don't need to have large data set. So for signals, you are all the time, and I'll give you an example of wearables. You are walking around, you don't know what kind of a signal you are dealing with. This will allow us to characterize, analyze signal on real-time basis, and provide a results on real-time basis. Could be very powerful for 
uh, smaller form factor devices. So the challenges with the personalization of experience. OEMs and MNOs are constantly looking for cost-effective single SKU solution towards maximizing their profit, not necessarily offering same for end user experience. Audio is a very subjective. Therefore, single SKU solution without taking end user into consideration would not offer personalized audio experience to the end user. My auditory needs are different than yours. My the device I receive off the shelf that was supposed to be tuned by OEM's tuning engineer, but his and her auditory system is not same as mine. So there is a need for offering a feature which allow end user to personalize these devices based on their auditory needs, not based on the what OEM thought uh, this is what the customer required. And we believe that this could be made possible utilizing AI ML techniques. Multi microphone in headsets primarily used for ANC could also be used for localized and tracking the sound sources. This then could be used to create end users at a little transfer function of the left ear and the right ear. And then the personalization of experience could be offered with a combination of head related transfer function and user audiograms. And mechanisms should be made to offer these kind of experiences to end users. With that, thank you very much. This concludes our session two on auditory signal processing. The next session will be on the system design aspect. Thank you very much.